My name is Deb Barland, and I teach. I hang out over the field house. I love it over there. It's a great place. And I teach in the Department of Health and Performance and Recreation, which is HHPR. So we actually call ourselves a hyper. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you for laughing. Okay. If you if you decide that you just want to check out and you're not interested in anything that I have to say this morning, I hope that you will focus on this, which is why I wrote it on the board. That our relationship with God informs everything that we do. And because of that, eating is important to me. Um, as a matter of fact, wellness is important. And eating is certainly a part of that. The great thing about eating is we all have to do it. Okay, We all have to eat. So I want to spend a little bit of time this morning considering what it might mean to eat a little more mindfully, a little more thoughtfully. And I'm not in Eating is a journey. It's a, it's, well, actually, um, recently I read a book that talked about the difference between journey and pilgrimage. A journey is when you go away and you come back, and meaning you kind of come back to where you were. And a pilgrimage is when you you start out with no intention of ending up the same. You may come back to the same destination, but you're not the same person. So for me, an eating pilgrimage is. So I may look the same, and I may come back and sleep in the same place and live in the same place, but I don't do life the same. So I'm on an eating pilgrimage. I wasn't when I was in college. So don't say, oh my gosh. Well, some of you probably are further ahead of me on your pilgrimage with your eating. And I consider myself to be very moderate, very middle of the road. But when I was in college, if I wanted to eat a honey bun, I ate a honey bun. I didn't think about what I ate. I just ate it. And I burned off enough calories with my activity that I, I really didn't have to think about what I ate. But I believe that we really need to be thinking about what we eat, not driving ourselves crazy, not guilt-ridden, but that we need to consider what it is that we eat. I want to start with a couple of uh, short uh, video clips. I, I'm guessing that most of you as students have grown, grew up watching these. Uh, the first is from Over the Hedge. Have you seen, how many have seen Over the Hedge? Okay. So there are a few of you that haven't. So just briefly, in Over the Hedge, RJ is this kind of conniving raccoon that decides uh, to use, kind of, not abuse, but use these critters that live in the forest that's right next to suburbia. And Over the Hedge is suburbia. And this little segment that we're going to watch is called Welcome to Suburbia. It's only two minutes long. And it says a lot about the American food culture. Those of you that have seen the movie are kind of going, yeah, I know which, which segment you're going to show. But be ready to reflect on what this says about American food culture. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Sorry. out of my quills to do a little comparison. Look at this. The grass seems to be greener over here. Herb, are you certain you came to the same place? Yeah, because you know the raccoon said. Uh, okay, enough about him. I get it. So we can do a couple of tricks. I mean, it's not like he can walk on water. Hey, everybody. This way to the food. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? That is an SUV. Humans ride around in it because they are slowly losing their ability to walk. <laughs> How many humans fit in there? Usually, one. Ooh. <laughs> right. This flat is sharp. Your president of the Homeowners Association? Right. Oh, what? what is that? Easy, easy, don't worry. That's just a human being, and they are just as scared of us as we are of them. Now, if a human does happen to see you, just lay down, roll over, and give your privates a good licking. I love it. Your <laughs> <laughs> sign says the grass is supposed to be two inches, and according to my measuring stick, yours is 2.5. Did we just get the food and go? Really? Did they have it or not? Did you see? It was in the box. They always got food with them. We eat to live. These guys live to eat. 
Let me show you what I'm talking about. The human mouth is called a pie hole. The human being is called a couch potato. That is the device to summon food. That is one of the main voices of food. That is the portal for the passing of the food. That is one of the many food transportation vehicles. Humans bring the food, take the food, ship the food, they drive the food, they wear the food. That gets the food hot. That gets the food cold. That, I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> ah! What do you know? Food! <laughs> that is the altar where they worship food. That's what they eat when they've eaten too much food. That gets rid of the guilt so they can eat more food. Food! 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 So, you think they have enough? Well, they don't. For humans, enough is never enough. And what do they do with the stuff they don't eat? They put it in gleaming silver cans just for us. Okay, this is a whole different 
kind of a whole different feel. This is about a three minute segment that we're gonna watch. And for those of you that have not seen Wally, -E, uh, Wally -E is taking place in the, when the, the world has been basically decimated and it's a big junkyard, it's a big junk heap. And Wally -E is the keeper of the junk and uh, is a, um, a robot. And they've shipped all the people off to, uh, to this big space capsule called Axiom. And so they live in space because there's nothing, well, except one little plant, there's nothing green left. So, when, so here we are at Axiom, and this is where the humans are living until life can be restored on Earth. And Wally -E is this little robot. <laughs>
being connected to this screen and the crazy thing, and I wrote it down, Wally came out in 2008, and I don't think everyone had all their own little personal devices. And, and did they? I mean, iPods, I'm trying to remember, iPods, pads, all the, in 2008, I don't, that's cool. Yeah, so it's interesting that this came out, uh, they're mesmerized by the screen, and when the screen comes off, she's like, oh, and she begins to think. So really, no thought, no effort, complete loss of autonomy. And here there, even the adults are sipping bottles, and when he falls off of his little scooter or sled, he can't get up like a baby. I mean, did that occur to you? And it's almost like, it's like being a baby and sucking a bottle and um, not thinking for themselves. So hopefully, you know, we're not gonna go there, kind of lazy, indulge, and uninspired. And that's certainly not what we want to be. And then it's totally funny that the, the images they show of humans are, are upright and thin and I don't know, it just, it's just fascinating to me. But they're, they've been duped, almost brainwashed because they get swept along with the way everything, like they are told it's supposed to be. So quite fascinating to me. So I have this, my, my thoughts, and I don't know if you have a topic ever that you, that you so enjoy, that you have so many thoughts about the topic that it's really difficult to bring it into some concise ideas. And food is one of those things for me. So I hope I don't, I hope you don't sense, or maybe you will, that I'm all over the place. I try really hard to kind of condense this down to some thoughts that I wanted to share with you. The first are kind of some nuts and bolts about actual eating that I think we need to consider. And the second is, is a little bit more philosophical about the, about the act of eating and, and some, some ideas that, that I'm processing still kind of coming to terms with. But the first is, where does my food come from? And I think it's important to think about, um, at least briefly, not necessarily guilt trip, but where, where, do, where do we get our food? Uh, I'm reading a book currently that talks about the author decides to go into the food industry and she decides to become a, uh, a farm laborer and, and, work, and try to live, she's a journalist obviously, try to um, work on a farm, see if she can make a living, try to pay rent um, in not such great places, and hear people's stories, and it makes me, so it's making me think about, well, where does my food come from? Generally, do we even look at the label of where does our food come from? I tried really hard to find some potatoes that were, um, now in the summer, it's much easier to, to find potatoes that are, that are grown in Michigan, but right now, the only ones I could find um, were at Hutch's, and they were kind of green, which would make sense. So if I want to buy potatoes right now, um, they're probably not going to be Michigan potatoes. So um, as I consider where my food comes from, again, I'm not, I don't think it's necessary for us to, to put ourselves on a guilt trip, but is it possible, of course, in the, in the warmer months, in the summer, is it possible for us to eat more locally grown food? Is it possible to grow our own? And by the way, um, what's his name? Uh, Bilbo? Bilbro. Folks, sorry, <laughs> don't tell me I said that. <laughs> professor Bilbro, right? Our, a new professor at campus. Um, he is, is starting a community garden this summer that's going to be for Spring Arbor University um, employees and students. And I think it's going to be between the village and the K house there. They're going to have some raised, raised plots and boxes. So to try to promote community and obviously um, good food. But is it possible to grow our own? Um, is it possible that we could consider who picked it and under what conditions? And uh, when, when we want food cheap, which most of us do, there is a price paid for somewhere. Someone pays for the cheap food. And the cheap food sometimes is paid for with cheap labor and no benefits. And so I think it's important to at least consider, and I know we're on budgets, okay? But it's at least um, important to consider where does our food come from? Um, Another question or point that I, I think about periodically is there's a concept called a food desert. And uh, I've spent a bit of time volunteering at Jackson Interface Shelter. Have many of you been there before? Okay. Jackson Interface Shelter is right in downtown Jackson. It's at the corner of Franklin and Blackstone. If, you, um, if you've ever been in that area, it's actually quite near Hinkley's Bakery. Interesting. <laughs> uh, and many of you have probably been to Hinkley's. It's just down the street. But a food desert is where people do not have access to healthy food. So many people that live um, in and around the shelter don't have their own transportation. So if you were gonna walk to get food, um, other than some restaurants downtown, 
and there aren't very many restaurants in downtown Jackson. You could walk to Hinkley's on certain days of the week, which probably wouldn't be a good practice for every day food <laughs> consumption. Or I can't remember the name of the little party store, convenience store, liquor store that's just up the street at First and Franklin. But that's it. So if people want to buy healthy food, they really don't have much access to healthy food, and that's called a food desert. Um, as we consider from mindless to thoughtful eating, uh, one of my Besides this major point that our relationship with God informs everything we do, um, I want us to consider how we forfeit our rights when we open a package of food. Now again, this is, a, this is all a process, okay? But when you open a package, you're forfeiting your rights, unless you agree with everything that's in there. So if you're going to open a package, it would be interesting to read the label and see what's in it. And many of us don't have time. And I understand time and budget constraints, but we do forfeit that. And when we eat out, we forfeit our right to choose unless we say, uh, what's, how's that cooked and what's that cooked in? And you could say, to a certain extent, you forfeit your right to choose in the dining commons unless you ask. And if you ask, I think they'll tell you what, so what's that, what's that oily stuff that the broccoli is in, you know? And, and is it pot? And if you don't want anything on your broccoli, you can go to the salad bar and you can get just just plain broccoli. But it is interesting that we can give up that right. Um, if it is from a package, are there reasonable alternatives? And again, my pilgrimage is taking me on, so on, a, on a path where I say, okay, but what if I have to eat from a package? Then what am I gonna do? If you eat from a package like ramen noodles, which is fairly popular, isn't it, with your generation? So if you're gonna eat ramen, um, first of all, the serving size is two. I don't know if you knew that, but a package of ramen is supposed to be shared by two people, which is quite hysterical to me. But if you're going to eat ramen, you could add some vegetables to the ramen, and you could use half the seasoning packet and greatly reduce the sodium. Now, that's not going to do anything about the saturated fat with the ramen noodles, but if you can only go so far, that's a beginning step, and I see that as kind of a step in the process. Um, if you're going to eat, I don't know if you ate punch keys yesterday. I hope not plural. But if you're going to eat a punch key, maybe you could cut it into quarters. And then maybe that really should be shared with someone. Did any of you have a punch key yesterday for Fat Tuesday? I'm sure they have some leftovers at Hutch's. <laughs> um, they didn't have any Bavarian cream. So um, I can't shop at Whole Foods all the time. As a matter of fact, I, I, Robbie Bolton last night said, you know, some people call it Whole Paycheck. Um, <laughs> but, and, and actually, I don't have time to drive to Ann Arbor to buy my food. But are, are there, is there something in between you know, that we can do? Are there, are there reasonable alternatives? And I, I put out here, um, if you're interested, and maybe you've already heard it, maybe you've got it memorized, but if you want, I know a lot of people are trying to buy organic, and organic is more expensive. It costs more to produce. So if you're interested in buying organic, there's what, what we call the dirty dozen and the clean dozen. Some, I've also heard the clean 15. I went with dirty dozen and clean dozen this time. For the most part, the dirty dozen are, are fruits and vegetables where we eat the surface of it. Um, berries, although, and apples, I think, is it celery? Yeah, celery's on there. Celery's really, really high, and as far as um, containing pesticides. And then things that we peel, um, you know, onions, avocados, although with the exception of asparagus, um, cantaloupe, grapefruit, watermelon. It doesn't mean that they don't have any pesticide residue, but it's reduced. Um, another thing, I'm talking about redeeming a meal. And again, this, these are things, I think I came up with that myself. I don't know, I read so much that I can't remember if I read it somewhere, but we redeem, I'm in constant negotiations at home with my boys. Um, we have two older children that are 26 and 23. They encourage me to stay the course. They say, we turned out okay, Mom, so you just <laughs> stay the course with them. Well, now we have, uh, we have an 11-year-old and a 10-year-old. And so when I ask my, my kids, okay, what do you want for supper this week? I know what my 10-year-old's gonna say, hot dogs. Okay, so how do I redeem? Do I say, no, absolutely not. I try to redeem it. I can, you can redeem a hot dog, at least. Some people might say you can't. There's a lot of variety within hot dogs, but we, when we eat hot dogs, I buy whole wheat buns, and we have, well, this is just a sample, an example. Um, whole wheat buns, and then we have fresh broccoli and grapefruit. And my family eats it, and they're okay with that. So to me, that's redeeming a hot dog, okay? And hopefully, 
he'll probably eat two, but hopefully not three, okay? <laughs> but to me, that's redeeming. And once in a while they go, oh no, not wheat buns. And then I also sneak all kinds of, you know, whole grain pasta um, into, into our food. And I call that, you know, redeeming it. Um, so we don't want to eat mindlessly, like in Wally. To me, I just have this image stuck in my head of people floating around and just grabbing and, and drinking and being on a screen, and we go, that's ridiculous. But yet we do the same thing many times. If I'm on my computer and I've got that open bag of wheat thins right there, you know, and I'm just eating mindlessly, not eating out of any kind of sense of hunger, um, being on autopilot with my food, Okay, uh, I mean, did you know that dead people walk? Okay, dead people eat. I don't literally mean dead people, but if we're eating mindlessly and, and going through life on autopilot, it's kind of like we're dead. Um, so, I know that, I'll come back to Saber in just a minute. I know that we are all on schedules, but when you have the opportunity to experiment, with waiting to eat until you're hungry. Okay, now right now, I know that, I know that I've got a session now, I have a session, and you, you know, you kind of go through your day, I've got a session, then I have chapel, and then I better eat, because then I want to hear the chapel speaker, or the, the keynote speaker again at 1.30, so I know that I'm going to have to eat in that given time slot, and that's how life happens for a lot of us. But when you have the opportunity, it is interesting to wait and not eat until you're hungry. Have food available. Don't deprive yourself and go, then you go, I'm starving. And then you go to the store, which is a big mistake, right? But have food available, good food, and then when you're hungry, eat. And then when you are starting to feel full, beginning to feel full, to stop eating, which is more difficult to do, I think. A lot of times we wait till we're stuffed. And so that's kind of a, a little bit of a shift um, that's interesting, interesting to try. Um, savoring your food. When you, when you eat food, when you consume food, taste it. Taste the flavors and the textures and enjoy the color of the food. And then I actually put this up here for shock effect. You'll probably remember this, that you're supposed to eat food naked. And I don't mean that you're supposed to be naked while you're eating food, although I suppose you could be. But what I want you to try right now is I want you to try, if you don't mind, try some of these chips. That's what I've got them there for. And you can share, a couple people. Can, I really would like for you to try these chips. And tell me if you notice anything about them. Okay, I'm hearing it. What do you notice? No salt. Okay. All right, crunchy. Good. Okay, there's no salt. There is zero sodium. Now keep eating and taste. Tell me what you taste. Hmm? Corn. Corn. T taste it. Savor it. Does it taste good? And I, uh, I bought some, some of these chips for the Super Bowl. We just had Super Bowl at our house with our family. And my, uh, my 11 year old said, what's up with these? <laughs> you know, he's <laughs> eating these chips. And I said, well, we're gonna have salsa and avocado. I didn't think we needed sodium on the chips because there's gonna be plenty of sodium in the salsa. And then I discovered that I really like the chips oh, because oh. I can taste the chip. Have, have you ever eaten naked corn on the cob? I really challenge you. I was, I'm from a family where we used to roll our corn on the cob in the butter, you know, roll it many times around, lift it off dripping, and then, then you, just, you know, spread all the salt on. Now, if it's a good ear of corn, I really challenge you to try this. Try it naked. Corn, the corn naked. Okay, try it. And I forgot this is being filmed. <laughs> so try it and, and decide if you like it. You can taste the corn. Because see, our taste buds have been duped into liking the butter and the salt. And the salt actually drives us to overeat chips. I consume fewer chips and, uh, and then less high fructose corn syrup beverage with it if, I, if I'm eating the chips uh, a little more naked. So basically these chips are, um, are corn and, and there, it's whole, you know, stone brown corn and then um, some oil, which is kind of necessary to make chips. So, um, another thing, a rainbow on your plate. Sorry, those of you that have had me in class, several of you in, in here. It's really important if you're going to build a plate, uh, then you should have a variety of colors on the plate. And, and you say, well, why? Just so it looks pretty? Well, no, because that's representing a variety of phytochemicals and nutrients and the, the darker more pigmented uh, the darkest pigmented foods are going to be 
um, be the highest quality for you. So if you're building a salad, load it up with all kinds of, you know, you can put sweet peppers, you can, anyway, a variety of, of colors. And then another thing I don't have up here is to perhaps try new foods. Does anyone know what edamine is? What is it? <coughs> is it uh, soybean? It's a green soybean. And they're, they're fairly, they're good size, green soybean. And they're showing up, you might go, what is that? I think they have edamine uh, sometimes on the food bar or in the dining commons. And sometimes it's mixed into some of the cold salads. So don't be afraid of it, um, try it. And then this concept of, this is a lessitarian. All right, and I'm not I'm not a vegetarian, um, but a lessitarian would mean, for instance, a meatless Monday, where you intentionally don't consume meat for a day, and you may already do that and not realize it. Um, but just consuming a little less, it doesn't mean that meat is evil. But we probably, as Americans, have plenty of meat um, already in our diets. And one last uh, comment in this section is about, I really believe in whole foods, real, not the store, but whole food, real food, and the best place to find those if you go to the grocery store is to shop the perimeter of the store. Stay out of the inside. The inside of the store has, has all your packages and your cans and your high fructose corn syrup. If you shop the perimeter of any store, you're gonna have produce and you're gonna have um, meat and dairy, pretty much that's how the, how the perimeter works, and eggs. So, Shop the, shop the perimeter and stay away from stay away, away from the rest. Okay, do I eat for the right or wrong reasons? And I am not here to tell you what's right and wrong. But I think each of us needs to ask that question. And like we saw, um, you know, do we, do we eat to live or do we live to eat? Um, similar to what Dr. Yaman said, my uh, husband and I, have this really, really, these twin brothers um, that we knew really, really well um, when we were dating, as they're kind of responsible for making sure we got together. Um, that's another story, you can ask me outside of, outside of this. But uh, one of them is just loves food. And we said, Mike, or no, he just, he told us this, we were talking about food, and he said, you know what? The first thing I think of when I get up in the morning is what am I gonna eat today? Not what am I going to eat for breakfast, what, what am I going to eat today? And so back to this idea of living to eat um, or eating to live. And we need to ask ourselves, as we go to eat a meal, what do I need to eat to live? Now, I'm not saying that we can't enjoy food, because I think food is a wonderful celebration, but we need to consider. Um, how much fuel does a body need? And I had this really challenging conversation when I was taking a class at Eastern Michigan um, in nutrition. And I was in, in the class with uh, quite a large selection of, uh, of international students, as you might guess. And at the time, I was training for a marathon. Okay, a marathon is how many miles? 26. 26. 26.2. 0.2. And the marathoners know it because that 0.2 is, is uh, pretty, pretty serious at the end of 26. But anyway, in the process of training for something like that, you need a lot of food. I calculated that on an average day, I was eating an additional probably 1,500 calories on top of my regular you know, 2,000 calories for the day. So add 1,500 calories to that, and I, was, I wasn't really bragging to the professor after class. It was a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I was saying, you know, I wanna make sure I'm getting adequate nutrients. And she, she was so kind, and she said to me, hmm, that's really interesting. How do you justify working out so much that you have to consume that much extra food. And I got really quiet. And it really made me think. I mean, I wasn't working out so I could eat extra food, but the, the idea of food responsibility and calorie responsibility, and what do I do with that? And if I'm over consuming, am I, and I know sometimes people say, oh, I'm not taking food from anybody else. How am I gonna get it to them? Well, there's a, a definite expense in 1,500 calories of food. So that really made me think, you know, how much fuel does a body need? And, and again, it's a, it's a pilgrimage, it's a process, but I think it's important for each of us to consider how much food do we need and the right amount, not too much, not too little, but the right amount uh, to nourish our bodies and, and get us through the day. I mean, when we pray, don't we say, please bless this food to our bodies <laughs> and please, help these, this extra 500 calories that I'm gonna consume not, not be turned into triglyceride, okay? <laughs> well, 
you know, honestly, we need to think about that. Um, we perhaps we eat out of stress. I know people that eat less when they're stressed. I generally, well, I don't know if I eat more necessarily. I don't eat less, but I eat worse. I make poorer food choices when I'm stressed. Do we eat out of habit? It's three o'clock, I go home, my boys aren't coming home for 30 minutes, I'm gonna sit down, sorry. <laughs> I guess I don't need the volume anymore. I'm gonna sit down and I'm going to eat dark chocolate. I just about guarantee it, okay? That's out of habit. So can I break that habit? So this is the first day of Lent, Happy Ash Wednesday. So you have an opportunity to add something to, something good to your schedule, or to take something away. So I'm trying to replace dark chocolate with nuts and, and with almonds and walnuts, we'll see. Um, but that's what I hope to be able to do. Um, concept of orthorexia, anyone heard of orthorexia? Some of you that have had nutrition class probably have at least heard of it. Orthorexia is actually defined as righteous eating. Righteous where people almost get their righteousness or self-righteousness from their food. It's almost like perfect eating. It would be like a, like a good, a good healthy eating habit gone wild. Where people set begin where it becomes overly important what people are eating. Like someone might say, I can't eat that <coughs> apple because it might have pesticides. Almost so it's this righteous eating. Um, where people feel like they can only eat healthy foods. Now, it's not, it's not restriction like anorexia, but only eating, you know, these healthy foods. So that's kind of a, uh, an interesting twist. And, and I hope we don't go there. Again, so much is about balance. Um, and I have, to, um, I have to make mention of helping others eat. Because you know, people say to me, "Well, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to how am I supposed to give food to you know to people that need it?" Um, first of all, I think it's really helpful if you hang out with people that don't have adequate food. Um, you learn an awful lot, and I think it helps. I, I don't think the well, there's there are two it's two prompt. You hopefully you hang out with people that don't have food. You may be able to help provide food for them because the need is more is real. And it also helps us ask questions about food availability. And, and why, when I go to interfaith culture to volunteer, do I see someone, because I, I take students there sometimes, and they go, well, that person's walking around with a Pepsi. They've got money to buy a Pepsi? Pepsi's not good for you. And I go, well, let's think about, you know, again, the food desert. Um, but as far as helping others eat, we have friends of, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, we're going to Kenya next year. Um, yay! We're going back to Kenya for a year. We're going to be teaching there. We've been there several other times. But a friend of ours started a feeding program there, um, a, a school lunch program, I guess. if you, It's not like the school lunch programs here. And it is interesting that now we have, in many schools, free school lunches. But he discovered um, that in the local Kenyan schools that the kids were kind of just almost faint during the day talking to the headmasters that they didn't have enough they didn't have enough food to eat uh, because the parents had to decide well am I going to buy books and uniforms or am I going to have money for lunch for my kids and so they sent them to school but the kids have no food so what they eat is maize which is corn and beans like a red bean mush cooked up that's it maize I mean you wouldn't be trust me you would not be very excited about this and the kids line up with their little plastic bowls and they're so excited, and, uh, and it allows them to be able to concentrate and think. It does provide complete protein. But anyway, it costs $2.74 to feed a child school lunch for a month, okay? That's uh, pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And so I, that's like a McDonald's milkshake, I think. How would I know that? <laughs> well, anyway, um, but if, if you have any interest in this, talk to me on the side, or go to Kenya Kids Can. This is actually a website that's the, the Piper family, and you can go to food program and how you can help. You can make an online donation. The money go, I, I promise you, the money goes to feed these kids. They are currently feeding 20,000 children school lunches. Now, they're not, <laughs> not at one school, but and what they do is they distribute the big bags of maize and beans, and then there are our local mamas or women, mothers from the community that cook in the, ki in the school kitchen, okay, which is open fires, 
and they cook up the food every day. So it provides employment for them. Kids light up with their little bowls and they eat. Okay, so I, I'm fairly passionate about that. Um, and I see this as a great alternative. And you can, you don't have to be in, get into any mailing or monthly donation. Just you can make a one-time donation and not even give any information about yourself. So it's very non-committal, but it is a way, a definite way um, that we can help. Now, I really want to, with the time we have left, talk about um, celebrating, sharing, um, encouragement. Food is celebration. Food is worship. And again, I'm still processing this. Okay, I'm so I. You get to hear my. You get to hear some of my kind of raw thoughts. Um, and and even this morning, I was writing down some more thoughts. Food is celebration. Weddings. Now, you don't have to have a meal at your wedding. But if you do, people hang around longer, okay? And dancing's always fun too. And I can say that now. <laughs> Many years ago, I might not have been able to say that here. But weddings, um, extended family. Now, when I think of extended family, I think of meals. And I think of not the food that we eat, but I think of after the meal, we all hang out at the table. And we talk, and we talk, and we talk. Now, some of you might think of extended families and stress. So don't use this example then. Um, if Maybe food isn't a celebration for you, but I think of community. I think of gathering. I, I forgot, I was gonna look up last night, what's the origin of the potluck? I mean, did the potluck originate with the church? I don't know, but you know, I uh, used to be go to a United Methodist Church and one of the jokes was, um, what you need to, to get into heaven is, is you know, salvation and a passing dish. You know? <laughs> and the idea, this concept of potluck, of sharing, and usually when it's a potluck, I always know somebody's going to bring deviled eggs. You know, somebody's, everybody brings their favorite dish, it seems like, and they bring, they, they contribute to the greater good of the community. So I love this concept of shared meals. I love the concept of families gathering around a table, of sharing the events of the day. And sometimes our, boy, our younger boys will sit down and they'll eat real fast. They'll say, can I be excused? And they start clearing the dishes and go, whoa, 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 no, nope, come sit down. And uh, then we have to talk about our day. And they're like, oh, please, you know. <laughs> How was school? Fine. What was your favorite part? Recess. You know, I mean, and, but we try, we're trying to build community there. There's actually research that's been done that talks about families that eat their meals together. And the research says that the children are more likely to, as adults, to participate in healthy eating habits, and they're less likely to be caught up with, uh, um, in aberrant behaviors, you know, drugs, alcohol, violence, etc., because of the grounding. And I'm not saying that the family meal is the only glue, but families with glue tend to, tend to eat together. And I know it's not always possible. You've got people going every which way with schedules. Um, but this connectedness is really important. Uh, then this concept of food as worship, and this is the one I'm really, I'm really working on myself. And so I actually looked up, okay, worship. Well, reverent honor or homage to God. So if food is worship, if, our, if God informs everything we do, then I'm thinking, okay, so if I'm gonna worship God, when I think of worship, I think of surrender. If I'm singing a praise and worship song, I think of being holy gods and surrendering and engaging, um, confessing, coming to the cross. Can we do all of that around a table? Um, I believe that food is life. Okay, food is life. It's life giving, or it should be. Now, have I ever gone through the drive-thru and gotten a McDouble at McDonald's? Yep. Okay, is that my best choice? Nope, but you know it's cheap and it's fast and sometimes that's what we do. But when I'm eating that McDouble, how long does it take to eat one? I don't know, you know, two minutes? Maybe not even. I mean, you just kind of scarf it in and, and there's no, not a sense of community. I'm driving in my car, you know, eating McDouble, going to the next destination. I don't think I'm worshiping, I'm not communing. Um, now I suppose, could you buy a bag of McDoubles and go home and plop them on the table and say, have at it, you know, yes. But uh, I'm, still, I'm still working on this concept of, of food and worship. And I think 
if we want to worship with our food, we can probably make some better choices. Um, I'm going to talk about symbolism of a table and come Lord Jesus here. I want to keep this up on the screen. This is a, I think it's a linoleum cut. I asked my husband, I said, which is it? Is it a wood cut or a linoleum cut? Tyrus Clutter was a, an art major here in the 90s. Now you were at least born, right? <laughs> okay, and graduated in the 90s. And he prints his own Christmas cards every year. And this was a few years ago. He sent this card to uh, my husband, Roger, who was an art pro is an art professor. And, and this, I was actually, a couple weeks ago, I was thinking about focus. And I was sitting at our dining room table. And I kind of put my head back. And we have this. I meant to bring the, the, we framed it, up on the wall, up above um, an arch. And I, I kind of looked up and I went, ha, thanks, Lord. There it is. There's my beautiful image. This image of, now, you could say that this is a, a Christ figure. There are no nail holes or anything like that. So you could say it's a Christ figure. It's, this, to me, looks like surrender. Mm -hmm. It looks like community. community. It looks like coming to the cross. But it also, when, when our family sits down to pray, um, we hold hands. And so this, to me, I mean, I almost get tearful sometimes thinking about it. But we hold hands and we pray out loud um, in unison. And when our son and daughter are home, we have six voices praying together. And they always go, oh, Mom, I know you're going to cry. And it's because I can, hear, I can hear the chorus of voices because we're worshiping together. Um, my husband, Roger, grew up Lutheran, and if any of you, and I don't think it's just a Lutheran prayer, but perhaps you've heard this prayer, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. And you could say, well, that doesn't mean anything if you pray it every night. Well, it does to me. And we have a couple other prayers, but that's one of them. We are inviting Jesus to the table, okay? If I invite Jesus to my table, does it matter what I'm going to serve? Would I give a little bit of thought to what I'm going to serve? You bet I would. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the keynote speaker, um, Leslie Leyland Fields, is coming to our house for supper tonight. I was panicked. <laughs> what am I going to serve? You know, it's like, oh my gosh. You know, but anyway, we're going to have non-Michigan potatoes. We're actually going to have potato bar and all kinds of variety of, of foods. Um, but this concept, if Jesus is at my table, is at your table, does it matter what you eat? And does it matter how much you eat? Now, do I think Jesus would scold me? I don't think so. I think Jesus would say, you prov you're provided out of, out of what you have available to you, out of your means, and your, your labor of love. But wouldn't I want to do the same thing for my family and for my friends and for gathering together? So this, and my children always say, Mom, I, I like it when we have company because we eat better. <laughs> that usually means we have dessert. Um, but, uh, but if Jesus was at the table, which he is, that's the irony of this whole thing. When we go over to lunch, Jesus is there at the table. Jesus is with me when I go through the drive through at McDonald's. Okay? And I don't, again, I don't think, I don't think that Jesus is going to point a finger and laugh or scold. But if food is life, then could I be a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more mindful about what I'm putting in if I really want to, um, if I say, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. Okay, I mean, isn't that kind of a, do you ever hear that? Okay, if we say that, is the food worthy of nourishing our bodies? Because we can eat better. We can't all eat whole from whole foods, but we can eat better. Okay, I actually have a couple more slides, but I put those last because I thought, I'm going to run out of time. I know I am because I'm supposed to release you now, but I would like to offer, I would like to pray before we leave. So let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, that we can think a little bit about food. I pray that you will help us not to feel guilty, but to, that you will help us to see food as a perfect gift from you and that you created it. Help us to uh, consider eating with our heads, our hearts, and our hands, and we give you praise.